Uh, we're going to start a series today, and uh, it could last two weeks, it could last three weeks, it could last four weeks, we'll see how it works, but it's called, Won't You Be My Neighbor, Mr. Rogers. Anybody not know who Mr. Rogers is? Just don't Google him, he might come up scary, but anyway, uh, we're going to talk about being a neighbor. In the Bible, an expert of the law came to Jesus, and he says, what do I need to do to, inter- to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looks at him, he says, you know what is written in the law. And, and, and then he says, yes, it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. It says that. And then it says, and the second is, and, and Jesus says it this way, and the second is just as important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, you know what the law says, how do I, how do I inherit eternal life? He says, you know what the law says. And he says, yes, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he said, and the second is as important, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then it says in Luke 10, 29, first verse, it's probably going to pop up on the screen for you. It says, but the man wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? I posted this scripture last Sunday, and if I would have preached last Sunday, I would have preached this message. But we had Logina and, and Jason Dillard from South Dakota, and I'm glad this message kept for a week, and it's kept. And So he says, I hear what you're saying, Jesus, that I'm supposed to love people, but what people are we talking about here? I hear you're saying I should love others, but who are the others that I'm talking about here? Who are you saying? Do I have to love people that don't like the same style of music I like? Because I don't like hanging out with people that don't like my music. Do, do I have to love people that weren't educated the way I was? I mean, I have a college education. I mean, I got my associate's degree over at Gaston, for goodness sake. I mean, come on. I mean, I, I can't be hanging out with people that dropped out in 11th grade. I, I, I'm, I'm educated over here. You know, I, they, they went to school, you know, where I didn't go to school. They didn't go to Ashbrook, so, you know, they can't be as educated as I am. Do I have to love people who, who have tattoos and piercings? And all those with tattoos and piercings said... Hey, well, yeah. Come on, all those with tattoos and piercings said? I don't, I don't have any, so anyway, but I love me either way. Do I have to love people who speak with different languages and different accents? Thank God we do, because everywhere I go, they say, where are you from? No, they'll say, what part of the South are you from? That's what they ask me, everywhere we go. Do I have to love people who are different colors than I am? Their skin is different, tones. Yes, yes, yes. Do I have to love other people? Who is my neighbor? I posted this last week, and I really thought that somebody would jump on and say, well, I love my neighbor. I've been living beside him for 26 years. I got that covered. And actually, I did see that on somebody's Facebook. Some, uh, someone said, would you, I want you to be my guest. And so oh, I've got that covered. I love you guys. Y'all are my neighbor. We love you. But who is my neighbor? I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers the question with what he always does, another question. Or a story, and he tells a story about really not who is his neighbor, but how he's supposed to love his neighbor. Not who is your neighbor, but how you're going to be a good neighbor. And Jesus assumes as followers of Christ that you and I, who are committed Christians, most of us in this room, that we should know that everyone is our neighbor. That everyone we come into contact with is our neighbor. So he tells a story about a Jewish man who is on the road and is beat and robbed and left on the side of the road to die. And then he tells a story about how a, a priest, is, a Jewish priest is walking by and he's got, I'd imagine he's got his hands in his robe because he's trying to be clean because he can't touch unclean things. And he's walking through the town and he sees the man laying on the side of the road and he just continues to walk. I guess he had an excuse because if he would have touched him, he would have been unclean, and then his hands would have been unclean, and it would have been unceremonial, and all these things. And so he just kept his hands, and he walked by. And then Jesus goes on with the story, and he says that a Levite, another Jewish man, walks by, and he sees the man, and he just continues to walk by without touching him. And then he says three words that really would have shocked the audience that he was talking to. And he says, a Samaritan man because he's talking to a Jewish crowd and, he, and a Jewish man is asking him and he says, a Samaritan man, uh, not a Jewish man, but a Samaritan man. It says this in verse 33 and 34. He says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds. So here's the man laying on the road. 
The Samaritan man comes. The Jewish priest went by. The Jewish Levite went by. And now the Samaritan man comes and he sees him and he crosses the street. He takes time to cross the road to come across the street where he is. Why did the Samaritan man cross the road? Because he saw a man in need. And he comes to him and he begins to have pity on him and he, he begins to, to find, show love to him and he went to him and he bandages his wounds pouring on oil and wine and then he put this man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him with his own money. And, and, and you know the story and left and said, if he has any more debts, just let me know when I get back and I'll take care of it. But why is this such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal that a Samaritan man is helping a Jewish man? The Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated the Jews. For 700 years, they had been hating one another. And during the exile, some of the, the Jews had been left behind and they had intermarried with some, some people who did not worship the Jewish God, Jesus, God himself. They worshiped pagan gods. And they intermarried with them and they, and, and it was, and they had children, were mixed race children, and who were known as the Samaritans. And then the Jews hated that. They had heard, they knew that and they hated that. And so in return, the Samaritans just hated the Jews back. You know, some people hate people because the others hate them. You know, I hate you, so therefore you're just going to turn and hate me. And that's how it works. So that's what was going on. The Jews hated Samaritans. The Samaritans said, you know what? Well, we hate you too. You know, Duke fans hate Carolina fans. The Carolina fans said, well, I hate you too. They just hate each other. South Carolina fans hate Clemson fans. It just, it's just a natural deal. They just hate. They hate on each other. Instead of doing what was expected, the Samaritan did the opposite thing. Instead of just walking by and looking, he said, it's a Jewish man, I'm going to keep walking. He crossed the street. He went to another man in need, no matter who that man was. He goes to this man in need, and no matter what his race, this man was a member of the human race. He was a human, and he said, I've got to take care of my brother, no matter who he is. If you haven't figured it out yet, if you don't read Facebook, today we're talking about racism. Racism is huge in our area right now, in our town, in our community, in our nation. Uh, I remember I named this, the name of this message, E-Racism. I went to a tour one time when DC Talk was the, was the jam. It was DC Talk and God's Property with Kurt Franklin and the Katinas. And I, was, I remember, man, I was there and it was called the Eracism Tour. We had Hispanics and blacks and whites all on tour together. And, and, and that was, man, when I was just a young youth pastor, and that was years ago, but we probably should do that tour again. Eracism. Dr. Martin Luther King addressed this story of the Samaritan in his, one of his messages. And he said, the first two people, the priest and the Levite, they asked themselves this question. They said, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? If I stop to ha help this man, what's going to happen to me? But the Good Samaritan asked another question. He said, if I don't stop to happen, help this man, what's going to happen to him? If I don't stop, what's going to happen to him? Which is the heart of the gospel, to love God and to love others. To love God and to love others. At least what? To love God and to love others. Which others? All others. Everyone. Everyone. Everyone, even if they're different, and especially if they're different, because they need love. Somebody needs to love them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love others as yourself. Dennis O'Leary said it this way about racism. He said, racism is not born, it's taught. He said, I have a two-year-old. You know what he hates? He hates naps. He doesn't hate any person, but he hates naps. And I know, you can go to any playground in the, in the, in the county and watch them. They don't care what color you are, but when, they, when mama says nap time, oh! Come on, Ma. Are you crazy? Why is it that people become racist over time? Because it's, they're not born with it. But what happens over time? I, I would say there's probably a few things. One of them is that you or a loved one that you know have been a victim of hatred because of the color of your skin. It happens on both sides. I, I, you could be white and, and be... And be Discriminate again. Discriminate. You can be. You can be black. You can be Hispanic. You can be all kind. It, it happens. You. It's either you or someone you love has been a victim, and now that's brought up some hatred in your heart. Uh, it could be taught. I, I've seen this too. I've, I've been on a playground and said, "Well, can't play with that kid over there." In our family, we don't we don't play with that that kind, or we don't hang out with that guy, or we don't do this. It could be taught. You could, be, you could be hurt by it, or it could be taught, or 
It could be just a, a mere thing called ignorance. You don't have knowledge of. You don't have knowledge of how the other person feels or the lack of exposure, a lack of perspective. You haven't walked in their shoes. You haven't been with them. And therefore, you think they're different just because they look different or they just, and, and, and that's become part of who you are. And no matter what the reason is that you ended up as a, being racist or having prejudices that way, I truly believe that racism is not a skin issue. Racism is a sin issue. Racism is not a skin issue. Racism is a sin issue. Now, now I will go ahead and say right before I get too far in this, I don't think we have a racist problem in our church. But there is a racist problem in this world. And we as Christ followers have to set the standard. We have to show the love of Christ. And I don't think it's a skin issue. I believe and I know it's a, it's a sin issue. How do I know? I read in James 2 and 9, it says this, but if you, are, if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. Well, I like you because you like me. I'm nice to you because you're nice to me. My kids can play with your kids because your kids look like my kids. Uh, you, you live on the same side of the tracks as, and you shop at the same store, so you're okay to hang out with. You, 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 you make, you know, if you're making your decisions on who you're going to hang out with and who your kids are going to hang out with or who you're going to do life with based on the color of skin, you're wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong to God. It's wrong to your preacher, your pastor, and it's wrong. It's just wrong. Racism not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. You cannot favor one over the other. It's, you're committing a sin. So as followers of Christ, we have got to show this world how to be a good neighbor. How to be a neighbor to everyone we come in contact with and to be neighbors to those who are different from us. And there's a few things I want to point out. The first thing we've got to do is we've got to recognize our prejudices. Whether you like it or not, everyone in this room has a prejudice in their life against something in some way. Prejudices are hard to see in the mirror. It may even be an accidental prejudice that you don't even realize is going on. I have a pastor friend of mine who, who was telling me a story about how he was cutting the church grass, the grass at his church, and he has pushing a mower in his streets on a, and his church is on a major road that people drive up and down and he said, someone pulled over and just had to do a business on him two doors down. He asked this guy, he says, he says, how much do you charge to cut the grass? He said, I don't, this is my church. I'm the pastor. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. My pastor friend just happens to be Hispanic. He just happened to be doing lawn work. And all of a sudden, this other guy had already had a prejudice toward that and a, and a stereotype against that and thought, hey, you know, and he said, I'm just, I don't know about you. I'm a white guy. I don't know if you knew that or not. I cut, I cut my grass. Nobody pulls over and asks me how much I charge. They just assume I own the house. There are prejudices in the town. They can happen. We have to recognize our own prejudice. Prejudice says this. Prejudice uh, defines this. A preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. A preconceived opinion that's not based on a reason or an actual experience. And if you're honest with yourself, most of us, if not all of us, we're raised with some type of prejudice in our life. Most, if not all of us. Because why? Because we're sinful people and we were born into sin. And race is not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. Maybe you were raised in a home where, where, where you were taught that rich people were greedy. Well, they're just greedy. They're, I didn't know if you knew it. I've been told rich people can't even get to heaven is what I was told. It doesn't, they got money so they can't get to heaven. Don't the Bible say money is the root of all evil? I said, no. The Bible says the, the, the love of money is the root of all. It's okay to have money. You can still get, go to heaven with money. So you don't have to be poor to go to heaven, but some people raise that way. Or, or some people raise that if they're heavier than if you're heavier than me, you must be lazy. That's how they were raised. Uh, the, you're raised that this younger generation, this next generation is just useless. They, they, the, the world's gone. It's over. It's, it's the end of the world as we know it. It's over. A lot of people will I believe that mega pastors are all crooks. Right? Close. Or pastors are cheap. Pastors are cheap. Let me tell you, me and April, we, we went to a Charlotte Knights baseball game way back when we were just early married, and we registered to win a car. Anybody ever made that mistake? Yes. Everybody's done it laugh. <laughs> yeah. Man, we got a call. You wouldn't believe it. A couple weeks later, congratulations. We drew your name along with others, and you haven't won the car yet, but you have won an all-expense-paid trip to Myrtle Beach. 
And if you'll come down here, we're going to sign the paperwork and you can get it. Man, we're young, we're married, we're 22, 20. We get to go to Myrtle Beach for free. Sweet. We ain't got no money. We're living off Chef Boy RD. We go there and we sit down and we listen to this little one hour spiel on how we're going to get this free trip. I hadn't seen free yet. They already took an hour of my time and my life. And then we sit down and he's going to begin talking. We're going, well, we're about to give you a, a free trip to Myrtle Beach and a, a, a dinner voucher to T Bones. And, 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 and you're still in the running for the car. But let me talk to you about this timeshare first that you just looked for an hour. And my wife asked a simple question. Well, how much does it cost? She said, oh, I knew. And, then, and the guy just jumped all over us. Oh, I knew you was good. You're just here for the free stuff, aren't you? She said, well, surely we are, but, but how much does this cost? We're here to sign up. Well, I still don't, to this day, don't know how much it costs. She said, well, why do you want Why do you want He said, well, let me think about it. We're not going to make a decision right now. She said, oh, I beg to differ. People make a decision. All of a sudden, somebody popped a wine bottle up. Hey, hey, welcome to our newest member. I don't think it was a setup at all. Anyway. And so he said, well, my dad taught. She goes, well, my dad taught me that I always, you know, think things over, sleep on them. He said, what's your dad do for them? He's a preacher. Oh, they're always getting free stuff. They expect everything to be free. Just say we were a little offended at that point was, would be a little understatement. And so we said, yeah, give us our free stuff. We're ready to go. And we weren't even old enough to take the dad burn trip. You had to be 25. <laughs> but we went to T-Bones that night and ate, didn't we, baby? For free. <laughs> didn't have Dylan with us. Didn't have a teenager so we could all eat. We could eat on that thing. So, but, you know, people are born with these stereotypes. You know, preachers are lazy or preachers want free stuff. And uh, white guys can't jump. Come on, man. I went to, I, I used to work at UPS when I was in college, and, I, and I'd go to the Graham Street, uh, to the Sugar Sugar Creek Community Center. They'd be like 12 of us. We'd be choosing teams. Guess who never got picked? I had the only white guy in the building. And they had to let me play the next game, and then I showed out and showed up and did my thing. I used to play some ball. And uh, I said, man, that white guy can play. See, just assume, well, white man can't jump, white man can't play. He's just here, I guess he's just hanging out. Bonds can't do math. I mean, I don't know what you were born with. You're just born with different things. Whatever it is, you have to realize it. Blondes can't do math. You have to recognize it. Well, people will say, well, I'm not racist, but. You ever heard that? Have you ever said that? Don't say, oh, me. Don't say, yeah. I'm not racist, but. Let me tell you, that but's been told. Don't, don't, you you just showed your butt. When you show your butt, we know. I'm not racist, but. You've already told us. <laughs> yes, you are. There's nothing good that comes after that word but in that sentence or in that situation. You have to recognize that you're racist on some level. Well, I'm not racist, but. Well, you may want to recognize. A friend that we met over the summer was telling us, a, we met him at youth camp. Aaron knows him, good friends, named Alfred. And we were talking, I, I just talking to my first conversation, we were talking about flying and going places. He said, man, I'm going to tell you what, that random selection at, from TSA is a bunch of garbage. He said, I am randomly selected every time I go through the, through the TSA. <laughs> he was born in Bethlehem, man of color. He said, I am randomly selected. It doesn't matter if I got on a hoodie or a three-piece suit. I am randomly selected every time I walk through the door. He said, it's garbage. And, and people have that. It's, if we're honest, that TSA may have a prejudice against that him. Or, and if we're honest, we do the same on some kind of a level in some kind of area somewhere in our lives. We have to recognize our prejudices and address those prejudices. The second thing we've got to do is we've got to seek to understand other people that are not like us. We have to seek to understand other people who are not like us. I was born as a white man and lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. I don't think there is a man of color, woman, anybody. Still, I go to my house right now where my dad still lives. Still all white people on that street. That's where I was born. That's where I was raised. That's what I knew. That's what I knew. I, growing up, that's, I played with all the kids on the road. We, we, were, we were boys. We hung out. We all got Miami Dolphin football uniforms when we were six years old for, for, for Christmas. We'd run through the woods and hit our heads on helmets. That probably explains a lot of things. You know, we just thought, you know, we grew up loving, uh, we'd heard about Larry Zonka, and we were big Dan Marino, Mark Duper, and Mark Clayton fans. And we were just Miami. That's all we knew. That's just who we were. It's a, and then I grew up, and I got a little bit older, and I started to play on ball teams and go to school and go different things. And I began to hang out with my teammates, who became my brothers and became my best friends. 
and begin to see things through their shoes and understand maybe they, they have a little different perspective on this world that I'm living in. I remember going to the mall with my friends of color and say, why are they, I, asked, I asked it, why are they following us in the store? He said, oh, they always do, man. You, you never been to the store with a black guy? We're going to get followed. Just trust me. I'm like, What's, what are they looking? What are they doing? And all of a sudden, you start to realize, wait a minute, this, this is not how I thought it was supposed to be like, you know? You have to take some time to understand some people and, and walk in their shoes a little bit and see and, and say, you know what, things are not quite as different. I can remember growing up in school and going, and, and I would hear the thing like this and say, I, well, one of my friends would say, man, hey, she's pretty good looking for a black girl. Like there was a different standard of beauty, right? <laughs> she was good looking, period. <laughs> no matter what. You know, and, and, but, but no, I didn't, we didn't, a lot of us didn't grow up with that, but the black girl did. And we have to hear those things, and we have to see those things, and we have to see from a different perspective. It's so funny, that from generations, some of you are a lot older than me, and you live through a lot of that. And now I, I know a little bit about it, and then my son, he sees it on TV, and he says, I can't believe people acted like that. And then he watches the news today and says, yeah, they're still acting like that. And you see that, and you say, man, how can we do that? How, we've got to get out of our little bubbles. Uh, if you've never seen that, and you've never experienced that, if, and if it's hard for you to understand, you need to have a conversation with someone that doesn't look like you and listen to the names that they've been called and listen to the, the situations they've been put in just because they don't look like everyone else. You need to do that. I challenge each of you to sit down with someone that doesn't look like you, that's not of your race, and talk with them and, and, and see what, a different perspective. Face to face, knee to knee, eye to eye, across from each other in a booth and say, tell me about some things that's happened in your life. And you begin to see some things from a different perspective. You have to take the time to understand others and exchange stories and walk in their shoes through their experiences and believe me, you're going to think some things. Man, I didn't understand. I, I can see a little bit different now. I can understand a little bit different now. I see how you could be a little angry now. I see how that could work now. Let's come together and become part of the solution and not part of the problem. That's what the church has to do. We've got to come together and be part of the solution to this thing, not part of the problem. As followers of Christ, we've got to recognize our prejudices. We all have them, one shape, way, or for some form. We have to seek to understand others. And then finally, we've got to love those who are different than us. We have to love those that are different from who you are. You've got to love people that are not like you. And that's hard, isn't it? You got to love people who aren't like you. Love not in word. Well, I love you, brother. See you next week. I'm not talking about loving by this right here in mouth, and I'm not talking loving in deed, loving in action, loving from your heart, loving them, respecting them, caring for them, uh, treat, treat, treating people with decency as a part of the human race, no matter who they are or where they're from. Uh, no matter who they are or where they're from, no matter what they're like, and loving them and showing them someone else loves them with the genuine love of Jesus Christ. That's how we've got to love each other, no matter who we are. We have to love with the love of Jesus anywhere, everywhere, anywhere we go. Racism is not a skin issue. Racism is a sin issue. Racism isn't just the presence of hatred. Racism is the absence of love. Racism is the absence of love. It's not just about hate. It's the absence of love itself. It's the, it's the absence there. It's the absence of an embrace between brothers and sisters. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's one thing to say something, but it's another to embrace something. And say, hey, I love you, man. Hey, well, let's do life together. Let's spend time together. Let's enjoy presence with one. It's the absence of family. In a family, we, we're all different in a family. No matter if it's what family you're from, you're all different. And you all have differences, but you're all accepted because you're part of the family. And that's what we've got to do as a church. We've got to be the family of God and embrace one another with the love of God when you and I are... Oh, oh, we, we love one another despite ourselves. We love each other despite our differences. We love each other because we're different. Man, wouldn't it be boring if we're all the same? Man, I, my house would not operate if we were all like me. It wouldn't happen. Thank God for April. Because she makes things happen. Gets the ball rolling sometimes when, when, when Chad's on some other plane or something over here. 
I'm talking about not a plane. I'm talking about this plane over here. Listen, how is the world going to know that we're followers of Christ? How will the world know that you and I are His disciples? How will they know? What, uh, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does it say about it? says nothing about our perfect theology. The world shall know that you are my followers because you have perfect theology. It doesn't read that way. I've read it. It doesn't read that way. It doesn't say that the world will know that you are my disciples because you are members of the church. Now, membership in the church is awesome. It's, it's needed. It doesn't say anything about you've been baptized or how much you tithe or don't tithe. That's all important. That's all that makes the church go around. Tithing's important. But the world's not going to know that you're his disciple because they looked at your tithing record. They, they're going to look, they're going to look and they're going to know, and there's only one way it says that they will know that you are my disciples by the love that you show to who? To one another. To each other, to one another, to everyone that you come in contact with. It, they're going to know that you're my disciples because you operate in love. You operate with love. And in saying that, it, it, it says nothing about loving people who are like you. It doesn't say, they will know that you are my disciples because you love everybody that looks just like you. It don't say that. It doesn't read that way. not translated that way. It just says, love one another. What's the greatest commandment? You should know this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. And the second is just as important. To love your neighbor as yourself. Well, brother, who's my neighbor? Your neighbor is the next person you come into contact with. The next person. Well, pastor, how am I supposed to love them? You love them as you have been loved. You love them as Jesus loves you. You love them while you were yet a sinner. Guess who loved you? Jesus loved you. While you didn't have anything together, Jesus loved you. He loved you despite you, and He did for me the same way. He hung on that cross, and, and, and when I, He knew good and well I didn't have it together. He said, I love you despite you. I love you even yet when you were still a sinner. He doesn't love me because I'm good. He loves me because He's good. He doesn't love me because I do everything right. He loves me because He's love. That's what He does. And, and if we're followers of Christ, we've got to love in the same way. We've got to be just like Christ. As followers of Christ, we're a reflection of who He is to this world that we live in. We've got to reflect the love of Christ to this world. They've got to know. If you guys want to come to the music, it'd be fine now. But you've got to love everybody. You've got to go after it. Racism is the presence, is just, not just the presence of hate, it's the absence of love. So no matter what the color of your skin, where you come from, or what your background is, you're welcome here in the family of God. You're welcome here in the family of God. There's only one race that I know, and it's called the human race. The human race. That's my heart. That's God's heart. And that's supposed to be the heart of the church. And it better be the heart of the church. Or we're, or we're missing it. There's only one race. It's the human race. Racism is, the, is not just the presence of hate. It's the absence of love. And we have to be willing to do what, what the Good Samaritan did. We have to be willing to, to, to do that. We have to be willing to walk across the street. To extend the hand, to extend the arm of love, the love of Christ, we have to be willing to do that. I love what the Apostle Paul said. In a racially charged time, he was speaking and they were arguing on who could be a Christian, who couldn't be a Christian. He says this in, in Galatians 3.28, he says, it's neither, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You're all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one. Did you know that God loves Asian Americans? God loves African Americans. God loves Latin Americans. God loves Native Americans. God even loves Cubans, Nigerians, Canadians, Koreans, Jamaicans. God loves. And when we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, 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 you know who all is? It's everybody. Everybody who's called on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All of us. If you're looking to get to a white heaven, you're going to be very disappointed. <laughs> if you're looking to go to, to the church of God section, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. It ain't going to work that way. Newsflash, all means all. 
It doesn't lose in translation. We will all be represented in heaven. Everybody, every human, every human on this earth will be represented in heaven. How do I know? Because John saw a vision of heaven. He wrote it this way in Revelation. Therefore, before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, every nation, every people, every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Everybody. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. God has a people everywhere on this earth. Oh, I'd have said amen if I was you. God has a people everywhere on this planet. Every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. Everybody knows how to call out to the name of Jesus. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Don't belong to me. Don't belong to anybody else. It belongs to God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. If we can spend eternity together, surely we can share a meal together. Huh? I wish I had an organ. If we can spend eternity together, surely we can spend a meal together. Man. Man, we can. Share time together. Do life together. Love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? It's the next person you come into contact with. It's the next person you see. It's your, it's your waitress at lunch. It's, it's the person, it's the whoever you run into with the same love and in the same way that Jesus loves you. Racism is not a skin issue. Racism is a sin issue. God doesn't like it. I don't like it. And it won't be tolerated in a church. And it shouldn't be. There's only one debt that you and I owe, and it's to love one another. One another as Christ loved the church. I'm going to close with this verse. It's in Romans. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know that verse, right? Romans, Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Every, you've, if you're a Christian, you've, you've quoted that verse. If you're a minister of any place, any type, any shape or form, children's minister, youth minister, music minister, you've all, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you know what verse comes before that? It's probably up on the screen. It says this, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. He addressed it, man. For everyone. You know, when I start off the service, I say everyone is welcome. That's what we're talking about. Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter where you were born. You didn't have any call on that. You didn't have any say in that. You were born who you were, and you were born where you were, and that you didn't have any, you, you didn't have it. There was no debate about it. You didn't get to, anybody get a decision on where you was going to be born at? You get to tell mama, hold up, I don't like this. I didn't get that decision. You, where you come from doesn't matter. Where you've been doesn't matter. What you've done does not matter. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? It's the next person that you'll come in contact with. It's the person across the street. It's the person across the table. It's the person across the row right here in this place right now. Hey, we've got prejudices in our own church. Well, I don't like that guy because he does things different than me. Hey, you got to love him. you got to love him no matter what. Well, I don't like him because he cuffs his, he cuffs his blue jeans every Sunday. How, why does he do that? Because I just want to show up my socks. I mean, that's all it is. Don't take offense. Why oh, you won't even tuck his shirt till in? Love me anyway. Listen, you got to love everybody. You got to across the table, across the across the across the here. You got to do it. You got to love each other. It's the person that's not like you. Hey, I'm not like you, and you, you better be glad. You couldn't handle this mess. <laughs> I'm barely holding on to it. It's not, you, know, you gotta love the person that doesn't act like you. You gotta love the person that doesn't look like you. Because it's your neighbor and you're commanded to love them despite them, right? You gotta love them. Jesus, Jesus doesn't tell us who to love, he just tells us how to love. He tells us how to love, how to be the neighbor that God's called us to be. He doesn't tell us who, he tells us how. If you will stand in this place, will you?